Colleagues, also on behalf of the Northwest University and the Faculty of Theology, welcome to all of you. It's a pleasure to receive all of you here in conjunction with the seminary, theological school, and uh, it is our prayer as well that this will be an event that will build all of us up in our faith and our service to the Lord and His Church and His Kingdom. Also welcome to colleagues who might follow the live streaming wherever that you may be, uh, we appreciate your being part of these, this event in this manner. It is my pleasure, colleagues, to introduce Professor Geisbert van den Brink this morning. He's our keynote speaker for the day, and uh, I want to thank him in, in advance for his willingness to travel to our conference and to address us this morning, to be part of our conference and to interact with the colleagues. Great appreciation, Geisbert. Uh, Professor Van den Brink holds the University Research Chair for Theology and Science at the Faculty of Theology the, at the FEE. He re his research is mainly focused on the interface of Christian faith and the natural sciences, but he also participates in wider debates on the relationship between science and religion. His current research is concentrated on two projects, <coughs> the way in which evolutionary theory coheres with classical theistic beliefs, and secondly, the nature and future of theology as an academic discipline. And that is what he will be addressing this morning as well. This first project uh, issues in his Reformed Theology and Evolutionary Theory, publication from Grand Rapids for uh, uh, plan for 2020, uh, <coughs> precursor of what appeared in Dutch already in 2017. And the output of the second project is mainly in the form of scholarly papers and contributions to conferences like this very one. Apart from what I've said already, Professor van den Brink is head of the Department of Beliefs and Practices, spending approximately half of his time doing administration. I can relate. <laughs> 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 Colleagues, please a hand for Professor van den Brink. Welcome, Geisbert. We look forward to listening to you. Baie dankie voor de uitnodiging om uh, hier te spreken. Het is een groot voorrecht en een eer van mij om uh, um, vanuit Nederland uitgenodigd te worden om hier te spreken. Um, ik zal zo in het Engels overgaan hoor, maar een paar woorden in het Nederlands, dat mag misschien. Ja, dat mag wel. Dat mag wel. Um, ik hoor niet tot een van de zusterkerken van de GKSA, maar uh, um, tot de uh, hervormde kerken in Nederland, daar ben ik dan opgegroeid, maar wel... Um, ik kom wel binnen die kerk uit een uh, psalmzingende traditie, dus, dus ook ik ben alleen met psalmen uh, opgegroeid. Ik was erg benieuwd of u trouw gebleven was aan die traditie. Uh, gisteravond merkte ik dat inderdaad de meeste liederen die we samen zongen toch nog wel psalmen uh, waren. Uh, ik kom uit de gereformeerde bond, um, die dus ook diezelfde overtuiging had, maar die wel binnen de mainline church uh, is gebleven vanuit ecclesiologische overwegingen. Um, dus het is mooi om vanuit die traditie ook hier te zijn. Ik ben ook blij um, dat ik vanuit de Vrije Universiteit hier kan zijn. Um, ik weet niet of daar van tevoren over nagedacht is, maar ik moet eerlijk zeggen dat ik eigenlijk niet zo wist over de, de sterke banden die er in het verleden waren tussen de uh, Potsdifstroom Instituut voor Christelijk Hoger Onderwijs en de Vrije Universiteit. Banden die dus in 1974, begreep ik, uh, pijnlijk afgebroken werden, maar die natuurlijk nu al lang weer hersteld uh, kunnen, kunnen worden. Um, dus ofwel, um, het is een mooie speling van de geschiedenis, ofwel iemand heeft erover nagedacht dat hier nu weer iemand van de Vrije Universiteit juist op uw jubileumcongres kan, uh, kan spreken. So I'll turn to English now, uh, speaking about uh, the future of theology at uh, uh, public universities. Over the past decades, uh, yeah, over the past decades we have seen a double movement in the development of academic theological education in um, uh, Western Europe especially, I'm speaking of Western Europe especially, 
On the one hand, theological faculties at state universities gra gradually turned into departments of religious studies. Although the uh, study of theology had been largely based on an objective third person's perspective for a long time already, uh, this was not enough to prevent uh, theology from being banned from many universities. Sometimes the academic quality and viability of the traditional theological faculty uh, was mentioned as a reason to close it down. In other cases, relationships between the secular university um, and representatives of uh, a specific church became strained to such a degree uh, that further cooperation was no longer possible. And in yet another situation, the theological faculty simply had become too small to survive. For all such reasons, um, the universities of Amsterdam, Utrecht, I, I myself studied at Utrecht University, but you can no longer go there to study theology if you want to become a minister, uh, at least. So, uh, uh, Utrecht is an example uh, of a theological faculty that turned itself into, transformed itself into a department of religious studies, just like Leiden, which, which just had become too small to, to, to continue. Um, so, in all these cases, these have become small departments of religious studies with broader faculties of, of humanities. Uh, and these uh, universities no longer offer undergraduate programs uh, that prepare for the training for the ministry. On the other hand, um, theological institutions outside the traditional universities started to gain traction and sometimes increased, increased their level, bringing it up to academic standards. A clear example here is the Evangelical Theological Faculty at Louvain, which is in Belgium, the Dutch-speaking part of Belgium, in fact, um, which started as a Bible school, but is now a classical theological faculty, uh, offering BA, MA and even PhD programs. In fact, quite some reformed students from the Netherlands now move to Louvain, uh, especially evangelical students um, who are in the church, um, in order to follow their Benedengraad, uh, their Voorgraad, their BA program in, uh, in Louvain. Um, and th this prepares them for the uh, master's training program for the ministry, the Predicants Master at the Protestant Theological University. And this PTHU is another example um, of an academic theological institution outside the traditional universities. Uh, although a, a university of its own, it only offers uh, theolo theology programs. And it's very young, it uh, started at, uh, in 2007 as the merger of the official educational programs for the ministry of, of the Reformed and Lutheran churches. Um, so these earlier training programs that had close ties with the state universities, these were severed and the, as a new institution the, the, the uh, Protestant Theological um, University was established. So the result of this double movement, I, I hope you can follow that, is a parting of the ways of theology at the classical university. Uh, indeed, in the long run, hardly a plain se place seems to be left for theology, theology as one of the disciplines to be studied at today's big public universities. Now, of course, I think we must be grateful for, for all other places outside the mainstream universities and uh, that we have for the study of theology. But from a Christian perspective, I would say, and especially from a Reformed perspective that highlights the sovereignty <coughs> of God, um, there is a strong theological motive um, not to be content with such places in the margin only. Uh, so it struck me in the Bible reading of this morning of uh, uh, Christopher Bali that this man who, uh, who had been healed from uh, evil spirits was not allowed to follow Jesus, not allowed to close himself off in a nice group, uh, but he was sent back to, to his family, which is perhaps, you can read that as sent back to society, sent back to everyday life, sent back to the marketplace. Uh, that, that's an, an interesting coincidence that we read that passage uh, this morning, I think. Um, if the God of the Bible is not just the God of our local tribe or denomination, but the creator of heaven and earth, and earth, and as such the world's deepest ground and meaning, then there is hardly anything as relevant as studying God um, in God's relationship to us and to the world in the places we have for studying at the highest level. In particular, if it's possible to know God as Christians hold, then surely God should not be absent from the contemporary centers of knowledge production par excellence, um, the universities. It is this uni universality claim of the Christian faith which, to my mind, should make us hesitant to prefer what is nowadays called the Benedict Option, retreating to the margins of society in order to build communities that can embody a counterculture. 
From this basic outlook, I would like to examine how the case of Christian theology, um, as a part of the curricula of today's secular universities, can be justified. First, I will briefly uh, discuss attempts to do so um, uh, by suggesting that Christian theology is epistemic epistemically on a par with the natural sciences. And second, I will look into attempts to ground the academic status of theology by arguing that its natural habitat is in the domain of the humanities. Uh, taking my own faculty as an example, I will conclude with a case study showing how the study of theology uh, perhaps can be structured at a contemporary secular university. Um, so uh, it seems that there are basically two ways to argue uh, in a generally accessible, so not in a non-confessional way, uh, for the legitimacy of theology uh, at contemporary public universities. First is to highlight uh, underlying similarities and commonalities between theology and, and the sciences. And the second is to consider theology as one of the humanities. So I will explore these two options in turn. Um, especially uh, since what has been called a descriptive turn in the philosophy of science, epitomized in the work of Thomas Kuhn, uh, Professor Coase uh, brought up his name already the, the other day, it has become clear that the natural sciences are less uniform in their methods and less value-free in their assumptions than have been assumed ever since the Enlightenment. Uh, to be sure, Kuhn's proposal to consider the natural sciences as governed by paradigms um, that can never be adequately evaluated from a neutral point of view uh, but require a personal involvement, uh, this proposal has been criticized and mitigated in ongoing debates in the philosophy of science. Yet, the awareness that what is going on in the sciences is much more complex uh, and mixed up in, in, in many ways than we used to think and that the so-called demarcation problem, so the problem how to uh, distinguish uh, science from what is called pseudoscience, that this problem can never be solved in a theoretical way, um, this awareness has had a lasting influence on the field of the philosophy of science. post kuhnian developments, as Larry Laudan's uh, notion of uh, pessimistic uh, meta-induction, I don't know whether you know this idea, but uh, Larry Laudan looked at uh, old journals uh, with full of scientific articles and he observed that uh, uh, quite a number of these articles are now obsolete. We don't, don't longer believe that what these articles in, in former uh, scientific journals tell us is true. So if that's right, how, big is the ch how great is the chance that what we write today in our uh, current scientific journals will be considered to be true uh, by the next generation. So this is the law of pessimistic, pessimistic meta-induction that perhaps science is not uh, so much on the right track as we, as we now uh, tend to think it is. And uh, also, of course, you have postmodern voices that pointed to the often hidden but crucial roles played by personal and institutional interests in determining the course uh, the scientists take. So it's not so strange, therefore, that theologians have grasped the opportunity to reconsider the bifurcation that the Enlightenment had brought about between objective scientific rationality on the one hand and personal subjective faith on the other hand. The idea, which is visible in, for example, in Immanuel Kant's Conflict of the Faculties, uh, that theology slavishly obeys divine revelation, whereas philosophy follows reason wherever it, it leads, this bifurcation has become problematic. In fact, the, the very concept of a universal notion of rationality uh, that is neutral and non-contextual has become obsolete. Therefore, it was natural that new and more constructive ways to account for the relationship between theology and the sciences were being explored. Indeed, during the past couple of decades, uh, we've seen a variety of such proposals uh, being um, presented. Uh, most of these proposals, f especially focused on the notion of rationality, isn't rationality a much more uh, uh, complex and uh, uh, variegated and polyphonic uh, concept than that it just coincides with uh, natural scientific rationality. Uh, in this way, uh, for example, uh, scholars like Michael Stenmark, uh, 1995, um, rational rationality in science, religion, and everyday life. Then say Murphy, um, she wrote Theology in an Age of Scientific Reasoning, 1990, and Wenzel, South African theologian Wenzel van Huysteen, The Shaping of Rationality, 1999, 
I have revisited the notion of rationality in order to broaden its scope so as to make it encompass ways of thinking in religion and theology. Even more recently, in his latest monograph, British theologian Alistair McGrath has compared the notions of rationality and the natural sciences and theology in order to suggest that there is enough overlap to consider theology as a serious academic endeavor. So McGrath's proposal is, is a bit more uh, sophisticated in that he distinguishes multiple rationalities, uh, but still he tries to align theology to the, uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to the academic status of the natural sciences. Now definitely there's, uh, to, it's possible there's, there's to say a lot um, in favor of this procedure. First of all, it urges theology to pursue its task not in a free-floating way, but with the rigor and discipline that is characteristic for scientific research in general. Theologians should be transparent about their methods and their ways of arguing. They should be open to criticism, just like other um, uh, academic scholars, and develop their views in ways that are rational. Not rational in a narrow way, uh, but in the sense of being understandable from the perspective of an informed outsider. Second, by aligning theology with the sciences, it's highlighted that theology as well has to do with questions of fact, not just questions of meaning. It has not a bifurcation uh, of the Enlightenment, uh, which has come under pressure. I think it can no longer be upheld. Um, if you look at classical theological questions, most of them actually, of course, have to do with uh, meaning of life, but at the same time, they are questions of fact. Uh, does human discourse about God uh, correspond to a divine reality? That is a question of fact. Uh, was the universe intended or uh, is it a product of chance? Is it credible to believe in life after death? It's yes or no. It's a question of fact. Can moral guilt be undone? Is there something special about Jesus? Yes or no. It's a question of fact, I would think. What makes human, worth, uh, human life worth living? Why is there so much suffering and evil in the world? There are all questions about the factual state of affairs, about explanations for that. Um, so theology is the discipline next to philosophy that studies these factual questions and tries to answer them as best as we can. Of course universities need not study all factual questions, not all of them are relevant, uh, but it can hardly be denied that these questions um, belong to the most relevant ones we can think of. For obviously the answers we give to such questions that I listed uh, a minute ago uh, make a huge difference to how we view the world, uh, our place in it, our future, etc. Third, by bringing, uh, trying to bridge the gap between theology and the natural sciences, an overly narrow model of scientific research is challenged. It's highlighted that there is no such thing as the scientific method. It's not just the natural sciences that can proceed in intellectually res respectable ways. Uh, questions uh, like the ones I listed uh, can also be investigated in ways that can stand the test of rational scrutiny. Yet, despite all such um, advantages, I've become more and more hesitant myself as to whether theology should bolster its academic credibility in this way. But there's also a couple of serious drawbacks uh, of this uh, procedure. First, it cannot be denied that this uh, credibility strategy, as it's sometimes called, uh, so the attempt to make theology credible by aligning it to the sciences, uh, feeds on what you might call the soft side of contemporary science, this uncertainty that raises its head on its borders when we turn to its basic assumptions uh, or its competing paradigms over time. It has been pointed out over against Thomas Kuhn that in everyday practice, I think Professor uh, uh, Carroll's pointed this out as well yesterday, in everyday scientific practice, uh, science has, ha has hardly anything to do with clashes or shifts between paradigms. Uh, the scientists are just testing hypotheses on a much smaller, much more down-to-earth scale, working on solutions to very concrete problems and making progress by actually finding such solutions. As long as theology cannot match this very concrete way of uh, solving problems by producing knowledge uh, that is widely seen as knowledge and not just as opinion, it will fall short of the sciences. No matter how rational its procedures may be, as long as it does not make uh, progress of some kind, it will always lag behind, raising the suspicion of being pseudo-scientific rather than proper science. Second, by modeling academic theology after the sciences, we unwittingly give credits to a stance that theologians should be rather critical of, I would think, namely the stance of scientism. Scientism being the view of life, I would say, the ideology that science, and only science, can deliver us real knowledge. Science in this context meaning the natural sciences. 
Uh, scientism holds that science can answer all our questions and if science cannot answer one of our questions this probably is not a good question. <laughs> Therefore, if one wants to gain academic credibility, one should shape one's discipline in such a way that it comes to emulate the natural sciences. That is what psychologists have been doing. Um, philosophers are make, trying to make this turn, at least some of them. Um, and the question is whether theology should follow suit. Um, by going this route, um, the scientific idea that the natural scientist, scientists set the standards of what is truly academic is reinforced instead of criticized. Third, following the credibility strategy also implies that the similarities between theological and natural scientific research are highlighted, whereas the differences are largely obscured from view. These differences, however, may precisely belong to the defining characteristics of what theology is all about. For example, um, theology is not so much nomologically interested in uh, law-like patterns, but much more ideographically in individual entities, in gods, and in how God relates to individual people and to society at large. That's not a law-like uh, 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 enterprise in that sense. So, as soon as we would turn theology into an empirical discipline, uh, we may feel tempted to start investigating people's thinking about God rather than being interested in God's self. Um, so relinquishing the defining focus of theology and transfor transforming it into religious studies. Another crucial difference that should not be obscured from view um, is that whereas the scientists need to endorse myth mythological naturalism, at least as a practical guiding line, always look for natural solutions instead of being content with an appeal to a supernatural realm, theology can never do so without betraying its very nature. Further, whereas the scientists strive after consensus, and in many cases even reads into subjective consensus over time, it may be argued that theology needs dissensus and debate. It seems that it can only flourish when universal agreement stands out. Uh, the question, therefore, is whether uh, theology should not self-consciously distinguish itself from the sciences rather than aligning itself to them. Um, now, it might distinguish itself by an attempt at special planning, asking universities to reserve a small safe place uh, inside its murals, where the principle of methodological naturalism may be suspended by appeals to divine revelation. Uh, this may indeed be a fair rendering of the current situation in many European universities, which still have a theological faculty, um, but we can easily observe that such a situation is suboptimal um, because sooner or later theological faculties become easy victims in the eyes of u university administrators who want to get rid of such ide idiosyncratic asylums, especially when they can save some money by doing so. Um, therefore, a better way forward may be to consider theology as an indispensable part of that other group of disciplines that have always populated academia the humanities. So let me briefly explore this option. Um, in a recent uh, essay that bears the wonderful title Committing Theology in the Secular University, so like you commit a crime, you commit theology, um, American philosopher of religion Kevin Schrilbeck distinguishes between descriptive, evaluative and constructi constructive task of the theologian and argues that all of these deserve a place in the secular university. Um, Descriptions have in com common that they are non-judgmental with regard to the truth claims of the religions that are studied. Eva evaluative work, on the other hand, aims at a critical assessment of what is going on in, re in religions. Questions that may be answered are, are these religious social structures oppressive? Are these religious experiences veridical? Are these religious claims plausible, coherent, warranted, or even true? Uh, questions which are traditional traditionally being discussed by the philosopher of religion. Uh, these questions can be answered even when one refrains from putting on a table one's own uh, view of life. Uh, but as soon as one engages in doing that, one has moved from evaluative to constructive theology. And Schilbrecht rightly points out that if one excludes such constructive theology from the table, from, from what is properly academic, many more disciplines than just theology are at risk. I quote, there is no way to exclude constructive theological thinking without simultaneously excluding a great deal of constructive thinking about ethics, metaphysics, political theory, feminist critique and post-colonial thought. 
clearly Silbrek is aligning the theology with the humanities here rather than with the sciences and it seems to me that that's the right way to proceed. Um, of course um, in the contemporary university the place of the humanities is no longer self-evident either. Neoliberal forces uh, would rather see all of the university's resources spent to disciplines that are that are economically useful and that train students for the workplace. Um, but if you think that such a truncation is a serious betrayal of the nature and the purpose of the university, and many people think that is a, a serious truncation, think of Martha Nussbaum's uh, book uh, Not for Profit, for example, where she makes a strong plea for the humanities. If you think that um, a personal formation, Bildung in German, is a task of the modern university next to doing research, Wissenschaft, then you should include theology in the academic curriculum. That would be my argument. Um, indeed, humanities have a different nature and goal than the sciences. The progress they make is not so much located in the disciplines itself, but it's located in the students. It's they who can make enormous leaps in their understanding, insight and discernment, epistemic values that are no less um, important than knowledge. One of the most significant differences between the sciences and the humanities is that in the latter the inquiry's perspective is not deemed irrelevant but is constantly being appealed to, the relevant of the student, of the person who um, engages in the discipline. Literature, history, philosophy and other humanistic disciplines may ask big questions that will never receive uh, answers that are universally agreed upon. Um, uh, but of course there is a great deal to learn from uh, studying such questions and society can only profit from people who have done so in a consistent way. Uh, questions like how did the past shape us into whom we are? What can we know? What dare we hope? What is good? How to deal with evil? What, should, what sort of society should we prefer? Uh, what is the meaning of it all? Is there a God? <coughs> Listing the questions in this way may enable us to see that the final question, is there a God, is not at all out of sync with the other ones. It would be contrived and artificial to exclude that question uh, from academic debate. Uh, of course these questions cannot be studied in any neutral um, uh, way. Nobody can prevent his deepest commitments and assumptions from bearing heavily on one's stake on these questions. Nor can they be studied in an isolated way. Um, I have to shut up, is it right? Or two? Okay, ten minutes, okay. Yeah. Nor can they be studied in an isolated way, as if the question <laughs> Whether God exists does not presuppose an entire form of life, to use Wittgenstein's term. Uh, so a complex and complete vision of the good life. Uh, so a, a very compelling retrieval of theology as the study of the good and the flourishing life has been published just earlier this year by Miroslav Wolf and uh, uh, a, co a fellow of him, Matthew Krosman, for the life of the world, theology that makes a difference. And here they uh, elaborate um, a, a, a view of theology as the study of the good life, of the flourishing life and they uh, compellingly to my mind argue that this way of doing theology deserves uh, a place at uh, contemporary secular uh, universities next to um, not only Christian uh, uh, theology but next to other uh, views of life and, and their theologians. So the best way to proceed uh, is to my mind by bringing all these deep commitments in the open, making them explicit and accounting for them as best as one can. Um, and universities might accommodate this process by appointing scholars from the most important faith traditions to study and facilitate these debates on, uh, on, on the big questions, including the questions uh, about God. So that these universities are secular it should not be interpreted as that they are neutral or uh, impartial or refrain from uh, uh, allowing views of life inside their uh, murals, but it should be interpreted to my mind as um, that, that they should invite the, 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 the most important views of life which are around in, in, in their societies um, to, to be studied and discussed and debated um, within um, uh, th th these universities. In other words, secular universities may hire confessional theologians of various stripes uh, since they are best equipped to articulate and negotiate their faith traditions. Here I uh, part company of uh, Schilbrek, uh, whereas Schilbrek accepts constructive theologians 
he rejects confessional theologians from playing a role in the university because in his view they are not accountable to universal standards of rationality. So he not only sticks, sticks to this contested notion of a uniform rationality, but he also associates this notion of rationality with an atheist view of life. Of course, confessional theologians should satisfy academic demands uh, as intellectual honesty, etc., but intellectual bigotry and laziness, undue deference to authority, etc., can just as well be displayed by atheist scholars. So excluding confessional theologians from the university for this reason, I think would rather be a case of power play and identity politics than that it can be epistemically warranted. Those uh, religions and non-religious views of life that are influential in a specific society should be given a voice in the intellectual arena without discrimination. And let me, um, I should have put this on the screen earlier, <laughs> I'm sorry for that. <coughs> yeah, so the price to be paid here is that a theology can no longer claim a monopoly position uh, I in the secular university. It should be, uh, this university should open up to include the main views of life in, uh, in uh, society. And let me give an example, finally, of how this might work in actual uh, uh, practice. Yeah, they should confirm, if they conform to epistemic vi virtues that universities should pursue, that may be asked of, uh, of uh, confessional theologians as well. So they may be asked uh, to uh, uh, conform to the virtue of intellectual honesty, to openness to criticism, willingness to discuss and evaluate one's own assumptions, respect for other views, being responsive to challenges, etc. All such values should be respected also by confessional theologians, just as well as by others. Five minutes? <coughs> In 1880, uh, the Vrije Universiteit was established by Abraham Kuyper as a reformed institution in order to counter the growing influence of liberal theology in the Netherlands. Though soon to be followed by others, the Faculty of Theology, Faculteit der Godgeleerdheid, was its only faculty uh, at the first time. For several decades, the VU as a whole, and its Faculty of Theology in particular, remained faithful to the ideal of its founding fathers and largely succeeded in implementing it. In an ironical twist of history, however, after the Second World War, um, so even before it became state-subsidized in the 70s, the VU itself gradually fell victim to liberalism and secularization. This tendency was epitomized in the work of one of uh, its most influential and iconic theologians, Harry M. Kuyper. He died just two years ago. And though the VU is still a special university, as it's called, a bijzondere uh, uh, universiteit, it's no longer a reformed or even a Christian institution. How did theology at the VU reinvent itself under these conditions? What is the future of theological training at a state-subsidized ins institution like the VU in a societal context that has become, is becoming more and more religiously plural? Unlike most other universities in the Netherlands, the Vrije Universiteit has resisted the tendency to transform its theological faculty into a department of religious studies. It has incorporated religious studies of various sorts, its curricula, but on top of that it continues to uh, commit theology uh, in what has recently been renamed as the Faculty of Religion and Theology. Um, so it does so in a way that has gradually become more and more religiously pluralist. The faculty closely cooperates uh, yeah. Um, with all kinds of seminaries from specific Christian denominations, for example, uh, Baptists, uh, Mennonites, Restored Reformed Church, uh, which isn't, did, didn't join the merger into the Protestant Church in the Netherlands, um, and also with extra Christian uh, confessions uh, and religions, Islam, Buddhist, Hindu and Jewish. All of those are very small, but they are represented at the faculty. As a rule, 40% uh, of classes are taught by seminary personnel and 60% is taught by faculty personnel. Um, in this way, um, the VU it can be responsible for the academic quality of the, uh, of, of the entire programs um, 
and the few professors may or may not have a religious outlook on life themselves, but views of life should matter to them and they should be prepared to engage in dialogue about views of life in their classes. Since these classes contain students from all these seminaries and religions, they form as it were a mirror of society. Uh, in this way, future religious leaders of each of these traditions can learn how to deal with the plurality of religious voices as well as with the requirements and constraints of critical academic scholarship. Um, they spend 40% of the time in their own classes, deepening their knowledge of their specific tradition uh, so they can strengthen their religious identity and theological identity, um, but they also have to train into a, a more broadly construed uh, settings. Thus, the Faculty of Theology gives uh, hospitality to other religious traditions, uh, helping them to relate their views and attitudes to the requirements of the modern democratic society. I leave it to your discretion whether this pluralizing turn can be theological, theologically uh, accounted for from a Reformed perspective. Insofar as it is a Christian and therefore a Reformed duty to seek the peace of the country in which one lives, perhaps this way of opening up the faculty to contemporary society and all its diversity <laughs> can be justified. Uh, in any case, I would argue that bringing it together so many uh, fundamentally different points of view in one faculty may have important epistemic gains, and is therefore in line with the Academy's primary goal, the production of knowledge, insight and understanding. Studies in social psychology have pointed out that in order to attain these goals, we actually need a diversity of cultural and religious backgrounds and perspectives. It's a myth, a myth to think that academics are immune uh, from confirmation biases, from in-group thinking and social pressures that are so pervasive in society at large. Uh, as John Reeves, Josh Reeves explains, I quote, and I'm almost done, uh, the greatest danger to the university is a lack of ideological diversity. Without open debate in the marketplace of ideas, the humanities will eventually devolve into mindless repetition because then ideas are held only as a result of the authority or status of those in the discipline. So the humanities do need a diversity of uh, backgrounds and, and input. Conversely, allowing such diversity in the theological faculty may trigger both professors and students to think for their own, whilst learning from fellow believers as well as from adherents of other traditions and to develop a strong personal sense of what is unique and indispensable of their own tradition. And thus, the treasures of faith can still be cherished and passed on to future generations. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Respert, for a uh, thought-provoking uh, introduction to our day. Thank you very much for that. Colleagues, we're just going to make a few arrangements. We're a bit behind time. Uh, so the, just a reminder that the next session starts in the Senate Hall, the, in the faculty building. And uh, the chairperson there will be Johanna Smit. And um, Olvets Wannepoel will speak first, and then Alma Cornelius. Also a reminder that Rian Fenter is not here for the paper following this one in this venue. So we can use that time, if some of you have specific questions for Geisbert on his presentation, then we can utilize that time for further discussion. So, uh, yeah, so and there's, uh, the other venue is smaller, so uh, there's, it's also about the seating arrangement. So if you want to stay and continue the discussion with Geisbert, then you're welcome to do so. Otherwise, if you want to follow the other speakers, then you're welcome to move to the other side. Uh, Francois Muller will continue the session in this venue as the chair. Oh, that's a nice solution. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
150 years of doing research on a reformed base, in a reformed paradigm, or we can also say reformed life and worldview. And to be part of that is wonderful. And we also want to invite uh, you to be part of that. It is wonderful to really look at this creation and do science. And what is science about? And that's what I'm going to speak uh, at this conference, actually on Friday, about the purpose and the norms of doing science. Science is there to broaden our knowledge. To do it, we must do it in a specific way. We call it the method. We must do it for according to certain criteria. And over years, we, we really work together to understand what is the criteria to base this knowledge on. We have different fields that we work in. My interest, uh, except for some of the philosophy of theology that form an important basis for the work that we are doing, uh, is uh, apologetics and ethics. Apologetics is about how to answer the questions that come to Christianity and do it in a convincing way, even for those that have some trouble to understand certain things and have trouble to even believe, even if they say they come from a, from a Christian background. So we have wonderful discussions and work that we are doing, research that we are doing about the questions and the discussions that come from atheism. Atheism and at the, at the other side, pantheism and panentheism. That means uh, the more Eastern religions and philosophy. Actually, and not, uh, not a lot of people see that for what it is, both the atheism and the more natural religions have the same basis. They actually believe that this creation is all that there is and we must work accordingly. Even if they call part of this creation God or God is in it, the panentheism, they still work with the same thing. This is only this creation that is either only part of the cosmos and the universe, or it's either godly, but it's just this oneness. And we as Christians, we work from an other view. We work from a two-ness side, if I may say that. We work that there is a creator God that created everything according to a purpose. And that's the important part of apologetics. So, uh, Personally, I love to, to look at the life and worldview, and we look at the origin of everything, and, and we discuss that also with those that believe in other ways, the destiny of everything. We look at the purpose, how every group and, and background and religion and uh, worldview, how they see purpose and also norms and on what they base in the norms. And from there, that is my other point of interest, and that is ethics. Uh, why do we all see the world in a certain way and see there's things that are wrong, th things that should not be, things that people do that ought to be in a other way? Because we all believe there is certain norms. But as we know, these norms can be changed, it can be uh, used in different ways, it can be based on different things. So how do we really understand what we must base our norms on? And that's why if you only work with this creation, and there's only this creation, you have really a problem for the norms. You, you actually must say what ought is what we find that is. Or you must, in a sort of a pragmatic way, look at everything and say, what, what is in it for me? Or what's the use? Or what will be better for society? Or what will be sin against mankind? It's all different ways that people try to, to found their norms on something. But from a Christian way of looking at science, the whole spectrum of science, we know that there is a purpose in everything that God gave us his purpose, that he make us responsible. We must respond to what he said and that he's telling to us. And that's why science is really not only normative, but it's actually part of our task, our responsibility on earth. And that's what my lecture is about. And that's what uh, is an important part of what we are doing for 150 years. And we believe and pray that we will do it for another 150 years. Thank you. Wow, you've heard that the Theological School of the Reformed Church in South Africa is currently celebrating their 150th anniversary. 
And part of this celebrations includes then this academic conference as a commemoration of these years. And the theme of the conference effectively offered the opportunity for us not only to look back, but also to focus on the present and future theological training. The School of Theology works in tandem with the Faculty of Theology, and I am a staff member of the subdiscipline of practical theology at our faculty. Since South Africa became a democratic state, many voices arose for the decolonization of programs presented at the university. For this reason, the Northwest University also had to revise their teaching and learning strategy. Certain keywords that is illuminated in the revised strategy are outcomes oriented, student centered, inquiry based, active, participative, and meaningful learning in a supportive and enabling environment. In short, it boils down to the creating of meaningful teaching and learning experiences. In the past, the theological training was largely based on the instructional teaching theory, where the cognition enjoyed more emphasis than our experiences. And in my participating in the conference, I want to link to the future of theological training at state subsidized universities. And in the process, I explore certain aspects that we need to take into consideration for the contextualization of practical theological training in order to find a balance between cognition and experience. The contextualization of theology is not a new concept, and many scholars contributed to the discourse. It is important to contextualize theology because human life takes place within a certain culture. Even the gospel played out in a certain cultural context. But the contextualization of theology today is very challenging and demanding undertaking. South Africa is a rainbow nation and each cultural group has their own preferences and unique characteristics. Whenever a group of people are together, for instance, a group of students in a university classroom, a new culture or context originates and knowledge and understanding of the culture or the context of those we minister to will contribute to the effective contextualization of practical theological training. I see the contextualization of practical theology more as an art where students can learn to journey with other people from the same or other cultures. It basically means to be with the other, to feel what they feel, to think what they think, and then to act in the context of our belief system. Jesus' parable in Matthew 25 is an example of a passionate being with feeling with, thinking with, and acting with the poor and the marginalized people. The challenge for practical theological training then is the inclusion of a certain level of experiential training, where the students have the opportunity to passionately being with those they minister, have to minister with in order to find a balance between the cognition and experiences. Experiential training is not new to our time of day, as Confusicus in 450 before Christ already said, tell me and I will forget, show me and maybe I'll remember, 
but involve me and I will understand. South Africa is undoubtedly in a season of change. It is now 25 years since democracy and currently so the South African population is plagued with more social ills than ever before. The high crime rate, unrest and the destructive violent demonstrations are but a few to mention. Unfortunately, universities are not excluded from these demonstrations and therefore education at a state subsidized university become more and more under pressure. In the past, learning was based on COPE's module of observing, reflecting, planning and taking action to improve the status quo. But the call for South African state subsidized universities is not to improve the curriculum, but to decolonize the curriculum. In my view, one aspect of the decolonizing of the curriculum is the inclusion of experiential training. If we as lecturers of practical theological training module, modules want to stay true to our reformed roots, we have to become relevant to our context and deal with the injustice by bringing deep change through making theology practical. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is François Miller. Uh, we are celebrating this morning um, 150 years of uh, theological training in recognition of the grace of the Lord. Uh, we are currently at the faculty of the Northeast University, theological faculty. Uh, this university was born from a process which amalgamated uh, two universities amongst each other, the um, University of the Northwest and the Potsdam University for Christian Education. And the Faculty of Theology stems from the literary department of the theological school uh, of the Reformed Churches that was started in 1869 in Burgersdorp 150 years ago. Uh, this was started 10 years after the initiation of the first Reformed Church in Rustenburg in 1859. In 1904, the theological school was moved to Potsdam. Um, and since then the um, literary department grew into a separate institution. Uh, today, these two independent uh, institutions, the Theological School and the Faculty of the Northwest University, um, has a very sound relationship. And um, on the Theological School side, we train ministers for the Reformed Churches. On the faculty side, we provide uh, theological education for members of several churches and not only for formal ministry as well. Um, a lot of our programs overlap and we also share some of the facilities. Uh, we share a number of staff members and there is generally a, a very good relationship between these institutions. Our proper teaching needs uh, proper research as a foundation. And therefore, we also spend a lot of time on that. And we have a number of uh, students, masters and PhD students from across the world, um, actually a few hundred, and uh, a number from Africa as well. Uh, while we're at the faculty, we have an outspoken view that we do all our academic work um, on a reformational foundation. And this includes the recognition that the Bible is the word of God and that it has been inspired, and that we regard the Bible therefore as authoritative, even for our academic work too. Now this week, we will be celebrating uh, the rest of this week, um, the 150 years of theological training, and um, I will be giving a, an historical overview, and history uh, sometimes seems to be 
a simple matter, yet um, what some regard as a high point, for others is a low point. And therefore I will not be looking at high and low points, but uh, mostly at orientation points. Um, the task of an historian is often to provide context. It reminds me of Jesus' words when he says that the master of the house brings from his stall uh, old and new things. And that's the task of an historian, to bring from the recent and the more long ago past um, events that can bring perspective uh, on, the, on the current issues. My own research is also in the field of church and dogma history. And um, I focus on the reformed creeds, such as the Belgian Confession, uh, the Canons of Dort, which was also accepted 400 years ago this year. I'm also a leader of the um, Ecumenical Perspectives subgroup, research group. And this uh, research focuses on the relations between churches within Christianity. And you are most welcome to contact us if you are interested in doing some work with us. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. We <coughs> welcome to the Faculty of Theology, where we celebrate the 150 years of existence of the theological school. And at this conference, we'll be dealing with various aspects, but my concentration mainly will be on the topic, the impact of the Reformed theology amongst the black churches. That's where I will concentrate, and especially I will look at uh, the history, what impact did uh, the Reformed theology had then, the present, and still in the future, because we believe that uh, this theology is needed everywhere. So, and then the other work that we, at the Faculty of Theology, that one is doing is the ancient languages. I'm teaching ancient languages, which is uh, becoming more scarce in other faculties. So if you want to study your Hebrew and its families, you are welcome to contact us. I'm also involved in the Old Testament studies. So if you want to do your furthering studies in the Old Testament, you are also welcome. Our approach is that the, w the Bible is the word of God and it's authoritative. That is our point of departure. So everything that we do, the word of God is the foundation of what we do. Thank you. <coughs> 